Yeah, you shouldn't really call it a church. Because inside the church, the household of God, Ephesians 2.19, you find the truth, which is Bible doctrine. Now, if you don't have the truth, well, I don't know what you have, confusion. I'd never been to church until I was 35. Didn't know what a church was. And when I went to church, I found a different atmosphere, a different climate, a different environment. What made it different? The truth. Because when I stepped inside the church, I stepped out of confusion and into the truth. Thank you. That's our message today, right? Is to come out of, take, change the name B.A. Babylon is what? Confusion and into the truth. We've got one, one uh, enthusiastic amen in the church this morning. So now, this is a picture of Katrina. When you have a crisis like Katrina, is there potential for sharing the gospel with people in need? Yes. Is there potential for gouging them for every penny they have? Yes, because the plywood, as Katrina got close, price of plywood went where? Sky high. And so there is a dual opportunity to give the gospel or to destroy it. Some choose to raise the price of plywood. Some choose to present the, starts with a T, truth. And the heart opens up in a crisis. We call it reality check. Isn't that true? Amen. Yeah. yeah. A dead church this morning. <laughs> what can change a dead church into a living church? The truth. That's it. Thank you. The truth. So if we stick with the truth, we might bring some life into the church. But if the truth goes out, the life goes with it. John 1, 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of, let me erase men and put church. So uh, now, anybody know what that is? What is that anyway? Yeah, where do you see that kind of thing? In the airport. Now this is the, the Hong Kong airport. I go into Hong Kong. I give them one dollar, I get seven. I leave Hong Kong, I give them seven dollars and get what? Whoa, 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 what? You get what? No way. Who said 80 cents? Brad. Brad. Brad's been in Hong Kong, right? You get 80 cents back. Because the money changer takes his every time it's just cut his fee. That's how money changers work. This is the temple. This is the church of the living God. The pillar and foundation of what? The truth. It was required because when you go to pay sacrifice and do your offerings in the temple, you had to have the temple shekel. And in order to get the temple shekel, you had to make a purchase from who? The, the pastors. And it was required that all foreign coins should be changed for a coin called the temple shekel which was accepted for the service of the sanctuary. Now, that's Matthew 21, 12. The priest had them over a barrel. Was there opportunity for price gouging inside God's church? Yes. yes. The money changing gave opportunity for fraud and extortion, and it had grown into a disgraceful traffic, which was a source of revenue. Who was getting rich? The preacher. Now, when you walk into that kind of church, and the priest's pockets are, are jam-packed full of gold, but as hard as of the, because dear friends, do you see a problem? Yeah. Now, so what did Jesus do about it? He went into the temple, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that had sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the table of the money changers. Now, as the priest watched, their prophets were going up in smoke. And cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. And this is what the church should be, right? A house of prayer. Now, the problem is, instead of a house of prayer, it become a what? Then a thieves. So Jesus took and ran all the preachers out, and who came in? Next verse. Who came in? 
the blind, the lame, the halt, the, those that... And as they came in, the preachers ran out, the poor folks and the sick folks came in. What did Jesus do for them? How much did he charge them? <laughs> now, was there... Should there be prayer in the house of healing? Well, there was. Right there. Should there be healing in the house of prayer? Yes. How are you going to rob somebody and pray for them? I mean, how's that going to work? You gouge somebody for all their money and say, oh, now let's drop down and pray about it. What kind of atmosphere is that inside the church? That's what was in the church in Jesus' day. I don't mean to be radical. I mean to be biblical. Is that what Matthew 21 teaches? Should we study to show 2 Timothy 2.15 ourselves what? Approved. 3 Timothy, chapter, uh, 3 Timothy, there is no, 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of profitable for what? Doctrine, that's Bible truth. Back up to verse 15. Paul told Timothy that, yeah, when he was just a child, the scripture is able to make you wise unto salvation. That's what we need in the church, the truth, the scripture, the doctrine. If that comes in, the money changers have to go where? Out. So what we need is more truth and less talk. Right? We like to talk about what I think and what she thinks and what he thinks and what he does and what she does. We ought to say this is what God said and this is what God did. Would that have a change in the climate in the church? That's the subject this morning. How to change the climate inside the church. And it starts where? With me. I am not judged by what you do. I'm judged by what I do. And what you do does not have to influence what I do. I got no excuse in the judgment to say Brad did this and Kenwin did this and Ildi did this. God will say, what did you do? Now, that's it, right? On the judgment, it's one on one, and that's it. Now, how many excuses can I present to God? Not one. I got no excuse. I don't think, do I? And, he, uh, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were what? Let's read it together. Sore displeased. Ah, man, we're not happy. Because the cripples are jumping for joy, and the people that the deaf and the dumb are singing and rejoicing in God, but what? Finish the sentence. We lost our income. And Jesus says, this is not the way to conduct church. But it doesn't matter what they're doing. What are you doing? I'm sorry, what am I doing? Now, Matthew 21. I took four places. You could have taken 104. Out of Matthew, Mark. Most, most of it's coming from, most of it from Matthew, some from Mark. It's almost like it's hard to believe this is in the Bible. And when he came, I'm sorry, and when he, Jesus, was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and uh, asked him a question. Where did you get the authority to come into this place and say what you're saying this morning? And Jesus answered their question with a question. Well, there's John the Baptist, right? Baptizing at the Jordan. The people came out. Was his baptism from... Above or below? Where did John get his authority? Isn't that what Jesus says in verse uh, 24? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I'll ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it from heaven or men? And they reason. Now before I flip the button and show the next one, what was their answer? Oh, we cannot say? No, we can't give an answer. To the plainest, simplest question, they said, oh, we can't give an answer. What was their problem? Same problem we have. Isn't that true? We believe in it's going, we believe everything's going downhill until the Lord comes, right? We believe in a spiritual declension. 
because as it was in the days of Noah, and it was tough in the days of Noah, right? The men's thoughts were evil continually. Is it going to be like that in the end? We're looking at a spiritual declension. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or what? I ask you, where was it from, heaven or hell? Are you sure? All right. Me too. <laughs> okay, me too. John said, John 1, 29, behold the who? Lamb of God. Then he said, 29 and 30, he must increase, I must what? Decrease. There's John, Matthew 11, 11, the greatest prophet ever born of who? A woman. Verse 7, what were you out to see? A reed shaking in the wind. Not John, the same at the river as at the Jordan, as at the dungeon. He was consistent, a consistent Christian. But now he asked the Pharisees, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If I say this, and if I say that, either way I lose. Before I give an answer from the Bible, 1 Peter 3.15, a reason for the hope that's within you, do I need to ask Mark and Verna what I should say? Do I need to ask Gildy Cruz what I should say? What I ought to say is what God said. I don't, and that settles everything, right? I don't, need to, I don't need to huddle up with Jonathan Costas and sit there and plan out and plot out my answer. You ought to think, you ought to pray, and you ought to speak. You ought to stand up, speak up, and show up for God. Isn't that true? Amen. That will change the church. Amen. 26. But if we say of men, we, we... Next three words. Fear the people. Revelation 14 verse 7, fear God and give glory to Him. Fear who? God. Now here's the problem. Is it possible to come into the church and be a man pleaser rather than a pleaser of God? Amen. That's the whole chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Chapter 3 verse 1, this know also in the last days, what kind of times? Perilous times shall come. Verse 2, men shall be lovers of who? Their own selves. Verse 5, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, comma, from such what? Turn away. That's what 2 Timothy is written for us inside the church. I mean, I, somebody asked me about somebody on our staff as they were joining us a while back. I said this, uh, what you see is what you get. Isn't that nice? John 1, 46 and 47. An Israelite indeed. What's his name? Nathaniel. And there's no what in him, Kenwin? There's no guile in that man. What you see is what you get. With Jesus, John 7, 46, never a man spake like that man. What you see is what you get. Verse 26. And if we shall say of men, we fear the people. For all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, well, <laughs> can't tell you. Wouldn't that be something if Al came to me, had some pressing question? Well, I, I can't tell you. I said, well, do you know Al? Yeah, I know Al, but I can't tell you. Because I'm looking for your vote in the next election. And if I say this, you're not going to vote for me. And if I say that, either way I lose your what? Vote. And I just became what? Starts with a PA, politician, instead of a now different place number two the same day came to him the Sadducees now let me pause a second before we read that the Sadducees had a distinctive doctrine regarding three or four or five issues the one they were known most for and Mark and Matthew mention it is they believed regarding the resurrection that what no resurrection mm, no resurrection they preached adamantly on the fact there's no resurrection and they come to Jesus and ask him a question about what? But they don't believe in it. No, they don't even believe in it. But they're willing to profess belief in that doctrine in order to do what? Kill the lawgiver. No, no, they're going to kill him. We'll fake belief in this doctrine if we can kill him. Isn't that insanity? I'm reading this in the Bible. I think, because this, this really how people thought back then? The answer is they think that way. Now, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. And they ask him, well, what about the resurrection? Saying, Moses, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were uh, with us seven brethren, and the first, when we had married a wife, deceased. 
And you know, you know, you get the story there, right? And then what does he say? What, you remember how Jesus kind of gives his answer? He says, you wicked hypocrites, <laughs> right? And, and, you, and you don't know the scriptures because they'll make you wise into what? Salvation. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when all the red, when people are resurrected, they don't even believe in it. What are the, they're, they're what? Hypocrites. What does Jesus call them? The hypocrite. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now you say, well, he didn't call them a hypocrite and wicked. Well, you got to get it from a different angle. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, now this is what they say. The Pharisees, those intent upon slaying the Savior, they say, verse 16, number one, we know thou art true. Number two, you teach us the way of God in truth. Number three, neither carest thou for any man. Number four, for you thou regardest not the person, we know that. And that's why they're going to kill him. <laughs> You know, you understand the expression, butter, butter him up? That's what they do to a turkey before they eat it. They butter it up. Anybody ever been buttered up? When somebody says something nice to me about me being nice, I think, what do they want from me? Somebody told me one time, our dirt road by our health institution, that's old dusty road. We need to get, somebody told me, you need to get the road commissioner to come out here and pave your road. You just need to send him some, and he gave me a list of gifts I need to send the road commissioner. We call that what? Bri a bribe or butter him up. I gave him my answer. Well, if our road needs paved, who am I going to ask? I'm going to ask the road commissioner up there, right? Instead of the road commissioner down here. Here, because John 1 verse 3, all things were made by, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus made the roads too, right? If he wants to put in a paved road, I can get one from him. I guess I'm, well, I ain't going all day about that, but. Uh, uh, verse 17, tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Why do they ask him that question? Yeah, are tricking, so they could kill him. No, that's all. They're asking him these questions, trying to find some reason to put him to death. Verse 20, 22, verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me, you what? Hypocrites, you wicked hypocrites. But these are the Pharisees and the priests and the scribes. Yeah, but they're wicked hypocrites. Why? They don't have doctrines inside their church. What do they have? Teaching for doctrines, Matthew 15, verse 9. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Whew. How about us? We ought to be studying to show ourselves approved. Doesn't matter what you think or I think, what does the Lord think? Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you. That's how he thinks. Where? Same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Now, the next one, Mark 3. He entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. Now, if you were showing me these pictures, i say, I don't know if I believe this. I'd be a Berean, Acts 17. I'd have to be reading it to see if this is really true. It sounds too bizarre to be true, doesn't it? But is it? And this is kind of the, the, the wildest one for the last, Mark 3. I read the third chapter of Mark. I thought, am I, am I reading that right? Do I, have, do I need to clean my glasses? And he entered again unto the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they, who's they? Who's they? The Pharisees. Uh, may I call them wicked hypocrites? <laughs> the wicked hypocrites are watching. The man with the hand. Who else is watching him? Jesus. Do they each have a purpose? Yes. What's the place? The temple. Is something about to happen? Yes. Verse 3. I like the way Mark writes. Inspired by God, but it's, you know, Mark's personality in there. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth! 
Now, I wonder why Jesus said that. Yeah. What was he about to do? Yeah. And if he saith and stand for her, and he saith unto them, now, before he does anything, he makes a simple question. Today's the Sabbath. We're in church. Hey, we are too. Here's a man, hand withered up. Is it legal to heal him or to kill him? Now, come on. Is it legal to heal him or to kill him? And what was their answer? Oh, we can't answer that. <laughs> Come on. Here's a woman, stage four breast cancer, metastasized all over her body. Uh, heal or kill? Uh, well, we gotta, we got to talk about that. We need a committee meeting. we got to pray all night in a prayer meeting. What is wrong with God's people? Come on. You asked Sister Bailey if Trevor was dying of cancer, should we heal or kill? Thank you, Sister Bailey. Because she... Regarding her husband, she loves her husband. Is the household of faith? Sister Bailey say, heal my husband. And we should say amen, right? But those wicked hypocrites, that's not what they said. Verse 3, and he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? To save life or to kill? What's Jesus going to do with this kind of folks, you know? <laughs> and when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, by the way, if health ministry cannot soften your heart up, nothing will. You got somebody laying in a sick bed in a coma for two weeks, their loved ones crying and weeping, and that doesn't do anything to your heart, then nothing will. Here comes a man all withered up, and that even that could not move their hard hearts. Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him. Who read the rest of it? We got to kill that troublemaker. He came into our church and brought truth and healing. He's got to die. How can this be true? No, are these insane men writing the Bible? Now, there's nothing wrong. When I get up in the morning, my wife says to me, yeah, I am. My wife says to me, Lou, any guesses what she says? Three words. I, thank you, love you. Anybody else ever have this? Does your wife say that to you? Anybody else? No, I'm the only one. <laughs> of course you do. That's, is that vain repetition? says it every day for 38 years. Is that vain repetition? No. It's repetition, but it's what? Thankful. It's, me it's meaningful. She just can't stop saying it. And I can't stop. That's it. <laughs> Now, is it more blessed to give 20, 35 acts or receive? I don't know. But when she says, I love you, I'm blessed, and so is she. But when you pray, use not vain repetition. I worked five, six years in Southeast Asia, the Tibetan prayer wheel. And some of you may have been there or worked there. They have this little device, like a whirly bird, that sends the prayer up 10,000 times to 2,000 gods. And they think if they shoot that prayer high enough and long enough, finally they'll get an answer. I don't know, what kind of God is that? Jesus told them, you keep asking. It's vain repetition. Prayer will. What's the problem? In vain they do worship me. Matthew 15, 9, teaching for doctrines. The 15, back up to verse 8. They draw nigh with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are where? Far from me. Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife? She came out, but her heart stayed back. Proverbs 23, 26. 23, 23. 23, 26, my son, give me your heart. If you come to church, but your heart's parked at home, then uh, you're a Revelation 3, verse 1. Thou hast the name that thou livest, but thou art dead. The dead church. That was the problem with Sardis. They all came to church, but their hearts were sitting in front of the boob tube. <laughs> Is it possible? You can sit in the church and think, who's winning in the World Cup right now? Brazil and Germany playing in the World Cup down in Brazil. And just before you come to church, you hear it's one-to-one, -one and you got two minutes left in the... 
and you're sitting here and the preacher's talking about <laughs> you get your update is it possible yeah dear friends the world cup has no meaning in the eyes of god if i brought home the cup to iron city would that impress you more better quiz God didn't care. He cares about the players, but not about their cup. Would you agree? For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, this is a picture. Lord, help me be careful. Politics lacks substance because it lacks heart. Because, not all, because uh, Daniel was in the government, right? Was he? Yes. yes. Was Mordecai? Yes. yes. Was Joseph? Yes. God has men in the government. By and large, if you want to get the votes of the people, you don't appeal to their hearts, you speak to their emotions. Because a man speaking from his heart to their heart that is poison in Washington. If I were running for office and I stand up and I say, what? Homosexuality? Bible forbids that. The clergy? Gay, gay people in the clergy? Bible forbids that. Transgender? Den, je, transgender? Genesis 2.24, these two shall become one flesh. All these issues. How many votes would I get? <laughs> I don't know. A few. A few. Might get shot. I'd have to get my Martin Luther King bulletproof vest, wouldn't I? Might get shot. Martin Luther King said things that were what? Politically not correct. I heard a speech once, Martin Luther King saying that God is no respecter of persons. Is it true? God didn't care. Now, to stand up at the Harvard commencement and to say, God does not look at your degree that you just spent $25,000 to get, four years in undergrad, three years in your master's degree, and two years working hard on that dissertation for your PhD won't get you to heaven. I'm sorry. That's a semester. It's not John 1836. John 1836, my kingdom is not of this world. The scriptures will make you wise unto the other world. So uh, now Daniel, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Daniel was part of the administration. I won't call him a politician, but he was in the government. Daniel brought his church thinking into the workplace. Ah, did he? Yes. And when they signed the decree, by the way, before Daniel threw the windows open, did he know about the decree? Yes. Yeah, come on, yes. I'm glad nobody said no. The, the, the verse before tells you he knew. Now, Daniel knew, if I open these windows, I'm a dead man. Is that true? Yes. And Daniel did what? Well, let me see. What's the doctrine say? <laughs> Thou shalt have... Open them up. Were there, about, were, there four, were there about 40, 50 Pharisees outside his window? And when he opened those windows up, what did they say? Got to kill him now. <laughs> no, we, we got him, but we got the goods on him. And as he's going into the, not jailhouse, but the death house, Daniel, 7, Daniel 6, verse 10, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will what? Deliver thee. Wow. Daniel was a preacher in shoes, didn't say anything. And when he came out, uh, Darius asked him, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? Yes. That is religion. You get that kind of man in the church, and it changes the church. Would you agree? Let Daniel walk in the door. Daniel kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now, Daniel kneeled. What if, I, what if I want to pray standing on my head? What do you say, saints? 
Let's ask God. Wait a minute, let's ask God. Lord, I really want to pray, but I want to do it standing on my head. I really want to pray, but I want to do it while I'm walking. Or I want to do it while I'm swimming in the tub. Or I want to do it, and the Lord would say what? Come on, when you pray, Luke 11, verse 2, say, Our Father, if you had some child, when would you want him to talk to you? All the time. So this is a nice statement from Minister of Healing. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees. I'm not against bowing. Not at all. But it's not the posture of our bodies. It's the posture of our hearts. 2 Timothy 3, 5. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees in order to pray. Cultivate the habit of talking with the Savior when you are alone, when you're walking, and when you are busy with your daily labor. But what if the king, Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2, says to uh, Nehemiah, what is the request you're about to present before me? My cupbearer, my wine bearer, the man I trust, cush job in the government. What's your request? What's the first thing Nehemiah did? Thank you. Then the king said unto me, what doest thou make request? What do you want? So I prayed. Now, that is a reflex action. That's habit, but not form. Right? That's habit, but not form. Nehemiah prayed. Did God answer? But he wasn't kneeling. I was on a plane that almost crashed. You think I got down in the aisle and got on my knees? I couldn't move. I was scared to death. I said, Lord, have mercy. Luke 18, verse 13. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he beat on his chest. We were going over the cliff in the green car. It was icy. We were going back over the cliff. Darling said, three words. Help me. No, she said, actually, she said, Jesus. I said, it was a gut response. We got up, started slipping toward the cliff. And Darling said, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Is that okay? Did God hear that prayer? And then she said, I'm getting out of the car. No need for both of us to go over. And she jumped out of the car. And she got out. And then I said, well, darling, go get the boys there in the, in the health center. And she couldn't get up the hill sliding back. I said, go get the boys. And as I was telling her to go get the men, the car is sliding down toward the cliff. What was my wife doing? And that car, tell them about it, darling, it turned around. Uh, nose first, went down the hill, and I slid into Joan's driveway. I said, what? Praise, Praise the Lord. There's no time for Pharisees and hypocrites when the car is going over the cliff. I was praying from my absolute heart. Short prayer. Help me. Help me. Is that what Peter said when he was sinking between the, the waves? Yeah. You know, look at those prayers in the Bible. Somebody's about to die. They don't have some long-winded dissertation. It's always what? Help! Does God understand? If you're standing on your head, is that okay? Now, woe unto you Pharisees. I'm kind of flipping back and forth between what it should be and what it should not be. Now, in 23, 14 of Matthew, what the Lord says is that mouth that you use to devour and eat up the home of the widows. Then after you eat up the widows' houses, what do you do with that mouth? Yeah, you long, you get up and pray. I ate three widows today, got all their means, all their money, in my bank account, I'm going to drop down and pray. Thank God for it. <laughs> and a long one at that. Because they were really thankful. Because if they got three widows today, maybe we'll eat four tomorrow. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. In answer to the prayer, Jesus says what? Double damnation. And somebody might say, what kind of answer is that? No, no, the question is, what kind of prayer was that? Which devour widows' houses. Now from Luke, the different angle. Which Parallel chapter, Luke 20, Matthew 23. Which devour widows' houses and for a show... Make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. It's all an act. Hypocrite means what? Greek, hypocrite, actor. It's all an act. Come to church is all an act. You know, is it possible? No, no, is it possible that the devil has an agent in the church this morning with the Bible open on their lap? And they're thinking about how they're going to separate the sheep out of the flock in the church. Is it possible? Yes. yes. 
We think, oh, the devil has orange hair, a, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, mohawk, orange hair, foams at the mouth, and a green tail. That is not how the devil, the devil comes in very sweet, very kind, very generous, invites you to the house and tries to drop acid in your mind. What does he mean? To poison the doctrines. Now, this is, uh, anybody know what that say, says? And you could read Hebrew. Now, by the way, before I say this, let me say God bless all the Jehovah's Witnesses. God bless the Jehovah's Witnesses. Those are a zealous people. Does God have a lot of good folks, true folks in that church? Yes. Now, of course, that's absolutely right. Are there a lot of devils inside the Adventist church? Of course, because the tares and the wheat grow together. God's got his people all over. We, we agree, right? Sure. I was coming home from Italy on a plane, and a guy that kind of looked like Jonathan was sitting beside me. Young, good-looking, handsome, well-groomed, nice clothes. I looked like death warmed over. Jet-lagged out, old, you know. Darlene said, I said, I didn't shave in three days. Darlene said, you never shave in three days. And I'm sitting there, it's on the side, two seats, he's sitting beside me, and I'm just dead. And the guy looks at me and he says, you believe in the Bible? I said, yeah. You ever read it? A little bit. And I thought, what kind of guy is this? Because he doesn't have a white shirt and a name tag on, does he? Who's that? The Mormons. And God bless all the Mormons. Somebody say amen? God bless the Mormons. I'm looking at the guy, and then he asked me about some other things. Yeah, yeah, we got a nice conversation. And then after about five, 10 minutes, I knew, I knew what he was gonna say, because he's headed toward Exodus 6, verse three. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they called on me. And when they called on me, they called me God Almighty, because they did not know my name, Jehovah. And so when we come into the presence of God, when we pray, when we address the, we need to call him Jehovah, Yahweh, Jehovah. Okay. Okay. Amen. That's Exodus 6, verse 3. And I said, you know, I was reading Luke 11, verse 2. And the Bible said, when you pray, say our... I was reading in the Old Testament, Isaiah 6, 9. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I was reading in Jeremiah, the root and the branch. I was reading in Mark. I was reading here, and I was reading there. John 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father. I have an elder brother. I said, I'm calling in some of them names. You know what he said? Mm -mm, can't do that. I thought, the Pharisees repeating. You can't do that. I gave you 107 Bible verses, and now you say, no good. Line upon line, 28 of Isaiah, 11, 12, 13, 14, line upon line, precept upon precept. You can't take one verse. You've got to take the whole picture. And so today I get a phone call. There's no Holy Ghost. There's no Holy Ghost. He's just this, he's, a, he's, a, he's either the, uh, the, the express, vaporous presence of God the Father, or he doesn't exist at all, or this, or this, or this, or this. I say, well, brother, here's 74 Bible verses. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> or there's no perfection of God's people. Ephesians 5, 27, without wrinkle and without spot. Jude 24, to him is able to keep you from falling. John chapter 8, verse 11, go and sin no more. 27 verses. Mm, it doesn't matter. Thy word is a, Psalms 119, 105, a lamp unto my feet. And a, no light, you walk in how? Darkness. I, thy word, Psalms 119, verse 11, have I hid my heart that I might not what? It doesn't matter. And, and there's movements like that still. You got the Yahweh movement here, and you got the Lunar Sabbath here, and you got, I'm not going to name anymore. You got this one, you got all these different movements, don't you? Everything from the shepherd's rods to the all kind of offshoots and everything, trying to separate God's people from the truth. If we would cling to the scriptures, we would be immune to that kind of disease. Yes. Do you agree? Ah, now, next question. Well, no, no. Well, let me pray. All right, Lord, help me to, 
play, tame my lips. Don't let me say anything I shouldn't say. Ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The problem, if you can only call God Yahweh, and that's great. You call him Yahweh, I say praise the Lord. But you can't say Father. It's like keeping God at arm's length. You know? God says, call me Father. Call me Elder Brother. Call me, you just fail, your advocate. Jesus Christ, the what? First John 2, 1. The advocate. All these names. Because, dear friends, I got needs for different people at different times. I need help building my house. Uh, Hebrews, 8, Hebrews 11, verse 10. Who, who looked for his city, whose builder and maker was who? Does Jesus know something about building? Psalms 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, does the Lord know how to build? Genesis 2, verse 1. He rested from his work. Does he know something about building? Yes. Can I call him builder? Dear Lord and builder, help me with my house. Was he a carpenter? Yes. Jehovah's Witness can't call him that. Can I call him? No. Can I? No. 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 Sounds like a robot. No. No. How about us? I'm almost done. Last but not least, Matthew had a job with the IRS. Isn't that right? Matthew worked for the IRS. And boy, nobody liked the IRS back then. They don't like it now. I hear Kenwin got a job at the IRS. I say, no good. <laughs> He'll come looking for who? Me. <laughs> no good. And by the way, if you work in the IRS, I was just kidding. <laughs> Got to be careful, right? Is this being taped? So Matthew 9, verse 9. Jesus, but before I read it, Matthew left the IRS. Was he happy to do so? Yes. He found comfort in the invitation, and then the first thing you want to do is share it. And Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs, and he saith unto him, Follow me, he rose up and followed him. And it came to pass, excuse me, it came to pass, as Jesus said at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners. And it tells you in Mark that it was Jesus, uh, Matthew had the feast. He called all these sinners, the pimps, the bank robbers, you know, all these people came. Jesus was in the house. Now, let's read carefully. Verse 11. The Pharisees saw it, and they said, were they finding fault with somebody? Yes. Who were they finding fault with? Thank you, Christ. And they were telling who? That's it. All right, so far so good. They found fault with Christ and told his disciples. Now, at that time, Jesus went to the Sabbath day through the corn, his disciples were hungry, began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Are the Pharisees about to criticize? Yes. Who? No, 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 no. The disciples. Who are they going to tell? Jesus. Next verse. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And that is the blueprint for destruction inside God's church. I, I'm so happy to have these sentences. It was their policy to accuse Christ and his disciples of Christ. Aiming their arrows where they would be most likely to wound. Instead of comforting, instead of healing, they were killing. That's it. This is the way in which Satan has worked ever since the disaffection in heaven. And all who try to cause discord and alienation are actuated by his spirit. I'm going to complain about the leaders, but not to the leader. I'm going to tell you. Now, I'm going to tell the leader some things about you. And that is the spirit of the devil to creep into the church and start criticizing. That's it. That's it. Revelation 12, verse 10, he accuses the brethren day and night. Now, we are not to have our hearts and hands weakened. By the way, the more the devil finds your ears open for this kind of gossip, the more he will fill your mind with it. That poison that he loves to sprinkle into the ears of receptive Seventh-day Adventists, he will fill your mind full of, here, come to my house, let me tell you some things that the pastor is doing wrong. And like an like a oxen going to the slaughter, we go and we open our ears. And like a hose, they spray that poison in there. 
And whatsoever a man soweth, therefore, Galatians 6, 7, shall he also, that's the law. We are not to have our hearts and hands weakened by allowing the suggestions of suspicious minds to plant in our hearts the seeds of doubt and trust. Well, you know, this man over here mistreats his wife. Don't you tell me. Don't you tell me. Matthew 18, 15, who should you tell? We're talking about keeping an environment in the church that is light and life. So the servants of the householder came to him. This is the battlefield. It's here. Came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, Is the purpose of sowing the tares to separate the brethren? That's still the game, right? Hasn't changed. And so last but not least, let's, uh, let's use common sense. This is not biblical. This is common sense. In Africa, when that lion, of course, it's symbolic of the devil too, when the roaring lion is after the, let's call it a what? Or a deer, springbok, whatever you want to call it, there is the lamb. The lion, in his mind, wants to do what? Huh? First step? Mm -mm. First step in the lion's mind. Se thank you. Separate what? The weak? Yeah. He separates the weak. Let, let me find the weak ones here and call them to my house, and then let me pepper their mind with doubts and suggestions and, and speculations and gossip. Now, you tell me what makes a man strong. There's one thing. May, may I say, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. Yeah, here's the problem. We go like a lamb going to slaughter. We haven't read the Bible. We hear those things, and we can't say, mm, thus saith the Lord. I was immune from that Jehovah's Witness telling me about this Jehovah doctrine. I was immune saying Christ was created and created everything else, but Christ himself is a created being. I was immune by saying Christ is not the resurrection. I was immune by, because everything he said, here's 20 verses that say you're wrong. That's our immunity. Do you, do you like vaccinations? <laughs> well, in this vaccination, it's not mercury. It's his mercy. We got to hide it in our hearts. Now, the reason I share this this morning is because this morning my wife said something to me. And uh, I got busy and it, the subject changed. What Darlene said to me is, I was talking about how the devil likes to attack the weak. You know, the devil comes in and he watches the people in the church and then invites the weak one over. Sprinkle that in mind. And Darlene told me, we had a friend, a good friend of Darlene's. Her name was, we'll call her uh, Kathy. She got involved in Jehovah's Witnesses. And Darlene was trying to, we were Adventists by then. Darlene was trying to talk to her. And she told me this morning, she said, Kathy is a nice lady. She was a nice lady. But they got her, and they dropped that poison in her mind, and Kathy became a Jehovah's Witness. Kathy didn't read the Bible. The point of the Reformation, what was the uh, mantra, the key word, the phrase, the ideology of the Reformation? Sola Scriptura, which means what? Translated in English? The Bible only. The problem, the Catholic darkness fell because they didn't read the Bible. But when Martin Luther got hold of that Bible, and, T and Tinley, and Huss, and Jerome, and Melanchthon, and all these guys in Berkwin, when they got hold of the Bible, everything blew up, right? <laughs> in the devil's kingdom. We've got to now ask you, how much time a day do you spend studying the Bible? Don't, don't answer. This is, this is rhetorical. Do not answer. How much time a day do you spend studying the Bible? Now, you take that and you weigh it with CNN and Fox News. Because CNN and Fox News are planting the seeds of doubt. If I may use a couple of examples. Homosexuality? Mm -mm. CNN, homosexuality? Yes. Uh, gay clergy? Bible? Mm -mm. CNN? 
Mm -hmm. The Bible, and then the issues we have. The Holy Spirit, who's the remnant church, um, women ordination, all these, these issues. How are you going to have an answer if you never read the Bible? Women's ordination. If your mind has been influenced by the people around you, that's the wrong influence. You ought to be able to have an idea from the Bible on why something is right or something is wrong. It's really simple. Now, Sister Charine, come on up. Sister Charine Chapman, one of our good friends, part of our family. We love this woman. With Charine, what you see is what you get. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 14, 15, sing with the spirit and sing with the understanding. I've asked my dear sister to sing us a little uh, sermon and song before I finish. And then we'll go eat. But come on, Matthew, John 4, 32, I have food you know not of. I've esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. Everybody's here. Where's, when's he going to stop? Lunch is coming. Come on, we got time for one song. Hey everyone, <laughs> glad to be back. It's been a while. There is one who loves me so that for me he died. He's my savior, so precious and true. On the cross, for my sins, he was crucified. I want to see Jesus, don't you? I want to see Jesus, don't you? He's my savior so faithful and true when i reach for the strand of that love bright land i want to see jesus don't you when i'm weary and faint he is always near with his joy my soul he does renew and he comforts my heart speaking words of cheer i want to see jesus don't you i want to see jesus don't you he's my savior so faithful and true when I reach for the strand of that love, bright land, I want to see Jesus, don't you? I want to see Jesus, don't you? He's my savior. He's so faithful and true. When I reach for the strand of the love, bright land, I want to see Jesus, don't you? Amen. So for our closing hymn, Brad, you're gonna, we have a closing hymn? Why don't we stand? We'll have a yeah, amen. Amen. Thanks, Sister Shireen. Number two twenty-three.
stand together as we close with this thoughtful hymn. 223. Crown him with many crowns. 223. I get a few musicians here. Crown with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark, how the heavenly anthem drowns. get some musicians here in a minute all music but its own awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity Two twenty-three. Brown. with many crowns the lamb upon his throne hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee all hail as his kisses through Those wounds yet visible above to beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight. But downward bend his wandering up at mysteries he's so great. Crown him the Lord of Peace. Whose power a scepter sways From pole to pole that wars may cease And all be prayer and praise His reign shall know no end And round his pierced feet Fair flowers of paradise extend Their fragrance ever sweet Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, the later voice of mine. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never throughout eternity. All right, I'll pray. Before I do, I know this statement by Martin Luther is true because it's in a great controversy. Our problem is the truth came so easy to us that we see it as cheap. Martin Luther, it didn't come easy to him. What did it cost Martin Luther to get the truth? When they took him before the Diet of Worms and they demanded he do what? Or you're going to what? die this is your choice it's either death or you give up your doctrines martin luther says the bible has taken my conscience captive and then he said remember what his answer was i take my stand on the word of god and i'm going to give you a modern paraphrase what you're asking me to do i can't do my choice I can say nothing else. We got it cheap because they died to give it to us and now we got it. How much time each day do you spend studying the Bible? It ought to be at least a few minutes in the morning and a few minutes at night. You say that's a crumb, but a crumb's better than nothing. The crumb, we increase the meal size as our digestion can take it. You know, so I'm going to, I'm not going to just, I'm just going to challenge you to try to be more interested in the Bible than we are about the World Cup. Amen. I'm human. I understand these pulls of humanity. I'll pray. All right, Father in heaven, yeah, the, the Bible has not changed. 
but I'm afraid that uh, we've been leavened and desensitized by living in this world for too long. I pray the Bible would have new life for each one of us, help us to be personal, help us to find something in there we can relate to. So many writers, so many stories, something we can relate to. And may we uh, hide it into our hearts. That's uh, our job. Your job is to change us with your word. Uh, we can't change ourselves, but we can hide it in our hearts. So give us grace, give us a desire, help us to see value and beauty in the Bible, and then to uh, make an effort to try to uh, do something that heaven can bless. And when you come, the desires of our heart are the same as yours because your word is residing deep within the recess of these sinful hearts. I ask it from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. Amen.